Hi everybody, welcome back to probability. Uh, we've already talked about events and values, probabilities and cumulative distribution functions, and we just started talking about probability density functions. So we're going to start with an example that reviews a little bit about cumulative distribution functions and brings us to some newer content on probability density functions. So the function sketched here, uh, let's say this is a cumulative distribution function for some continuous random variable x. So let's remember what cumulative distribution functions should look like. They should be non-decreasing. That's the cumulative bit. They're a probability, so they should always be between 0 and 1. The limit as we go to the left should be 0, and the limit as we go to the right should be 1. The definition of a cumulative distribution function is exactly what we need to use to evaluate this first probability here on the left. So if we remember the definition of a cumulative distribution function, f of, say, 1, is exactly the probability that our random variable takes on a value less than or equal to 1. So to figure out the probability that x is less than or equal to 1, we just have to find f of 1, which is here at 1 half. So this bit is 1 half. And again, this is straight from the definition of a cumulative distribution function. So now I don't want every single way that my variable could be less than 1. That was f of 1. Now I want every way that it's less than 1, but also bigger than negative 1. So I need to get rid of some of these possibilities. In particular, I need to get rid of all of these possibilities, which are captured in f of negative 1. So the probability that my variable is between 1 and negative 1 is the probability that it's less than or equal to 1 minus the probability that it's less than or equal to negative 1, because that's the range that's sort of undesirable. So f of 1, we already saw, was a half. That's right here. f of negative 1 is also 1 half. So this probability turns out to be 0. So what that's telling us is, actually, I'm choosing these numbers, and none of my numbers are ever between negative 1 and 1. So let's think about the probability density function. So let's remember a way of thinking about the probability density function. I'm running a trial a whole bunch of times, and I record the result every time. And if there's kind of clusters of results in one area, that's a dense area, that's going to have a high value in the probability density function. And if there's an area without a lot of results, that's going to have a low value. And the probability density function, as we saw on Friday, is the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. So this function we see here, that's my cumulative distribution function. My probability density function is its derivative. So it's easy to see where it's 0. My function is flat here, flat here, and flat here. So notice in the middle, this accords with the computation we just did. We said the probability of being between negative 1 and 1 is 0, and so my density there is going to be 0. 0 trials per square, per, per inch or whatever, are going to occur between negative 1 and 1. Now, this is just a straight line, so if I want to find its slope, it's just rise over run, right? Change in y over change in x, that's going to be my derivative. Uh, from negative 3 to 1, change in y goes up a half change in x is 2, so this is a quarter. So my function is at a quarter here, and we have the same slope here. If I wanted to graph my probability density function, that's what it would look like. I can also define it as a piecewise function. That's the one with the big curly brackets. So my probability density function, I use a lowercase f looks like 1 quarter if x is in the interval from negative 3 to negative 1 or the interval from 1 to 3. That little u is a union and it's 0 otherwise.
just to remind us again what all of this stuff is. Uh, so this one on the bottom, that's the probability density function. And again, if I were to do a whole bunch of trials of this and record each one, I pick some number at random and I pick some number at random and I pick some number at random and so on. Because the density is positive in these two intervals, all of my trials are going to be in those two intervals. And because it's constant, the density is going to be pretty much constant. It's not going to be really dense somewhere and really sparse somewhere else. So if I were to do, say, 50 trials of this random variable, I would expect that when I recorded them, the numbers would look something like the red dots below. I actually used a random number generator to generate a few points in these intervals. So I, I made the left and the right the same, but up to that inside the interval, it's what we would call pseudo-random. And randomness doesn't always behave exactly how you would like. You can see there seems to be certain clusters, but if you run it again, those clusters move around. Okay, so again, as one final review, this is a good point to pause the video. Think about what these three values are in this system. Big F of two, that's talking about the cumulative distribution function. And I can see from here that's three quarters. That means when I generate all of these random points, three quarters of them are gonna be less than or equal to two. So three quarters of them are gonna be in this interval here. Little f of negative two is asking for my probability density at negative two. That's this bottom function and that's one quarter. That doesn't have such an easy interpretation. It's not true, for instance, that the probability of getting negative two is a quarter. Because this is a continuous random variable, the probability of getting any one number is zero. Probability density functions are easiest to understand sort of relative to themselves. So it's a quarter here and a quarter here and a quarter here, which means I'm sort of equally likely to be in any of these spaces. But it's zero here, which means I'm not likely at all to be in that space.